Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the mammalian circadian timing system. Okay, so we're currently looking at the pathways downstream of the PAC1 receptor, which is a receptor for PACAP27 uh, and PACAP38. Okay, and we want to understand how this is going to uh, affect the circadian oscillator within the neurons of the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, and we want to see how it's going to lead to the upregulation of the expression of period proteins and cryptochrome proteins. Okay, so we've seen so far that the activation of PAC1 receptors has led to an increase in the level of cyclic adenosine monophosphate within the cytoplasm of our suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, neuron. Okay, so we now want to see how cyclic adenosine monophosphate is going to activate protein kinase A holoenzymes. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, a discussion of the structure of a protein kinase A holoenzyme. Because protein kinase A is not just one protein, basically. It's made up of multiple proteins, okay? And when you have an enzyme that's made up of multiple proteins like so, it's called a holoenzyme. Okay, so we're going to start off by discussing uh, the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. Okay, so overall protein kinase A holoenzymes consist of four separate proteins, and we're going to start with these regulatory subunits. Okay, right, so I'll start by drawing one of these. So, uh, this is an individual polypeptide, so here is its amino terminus here. Okay, and one of the first important domains that you have um, within the polypeptide is something known as the uh, dimerization and docking domain. Okay, so this is called the dimerization and docking domain. Okay, and the logic behind this name, dimerization and docking domain, uh, will become apparent very soon. Okay, so it's going to be involved in dimerizing two regulatory subunits together, basically, and it's also going to be involved in the docking of protein kinase A holoenzymes to uh, other proteins that we'll come to later, known as A kinase anchoring proteins. Okay, so for short, the dimerization and docking domain is often abbreviated to the D slash D domain, D for dimerization and D for docking. So let's colour in the dimerization and docking domain then of this regulatory subunit of protein kinase A in turquoise. Okay, so there we have it in turquoise. Then, after the dimerization and docking domain, what you then have is a domain known as the protein kinase A inhibitor site. Okay, so this down here is the protein kinase A inhibitor site. And this is involved in binding to and inhibiting the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. So I'll colour this protein kinase A inhibitor site in purple here, and we'll come to its function in a moment. Then, after the protein kinase A inhibitor site, you then have two domains which are involved in binding cyclic AMP, and these are in tandem, like so. So you have one cyclic AMP binding domain, followed by the next cyclic AMP binding domain, and then you have the carboxylic acid terminus. Uh, down here. Okay, so these two cyclic AMP binding domains I will colour in in blue, like so. Okay, so these are cyclic AMP binding domains. Okay, and uh, each one of them has a single binding site for a cyclic AMP molecule. Okay, so one cyclic AMP will bind here and another cyclic AMP will bind here. So, We've now completed, then, the important domain structure of a regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. So this is one of the four proteins that's going to assemble to make the full protein kinase A a holoenzyme. Okay, regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, which I'll just abbreviate, by the way, to PKA. So protein kinase A is often abbreviated to PKA. Right. Now, what's going to happen is, firstly, in the formation of a protein kinase A holoenzyme, you're going to get two regulatory subunits, and you're going to dimerize them together. And they will dimerize together at the docking and dimerization domains up here. So both of the regulatory subunits will have docking and dimerization domains, and these two docking and dimerization domains will bind to each other and hold the two regulatory subunits together.
So here, I'm now drawing another one of these regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, which is dimerized with our first one. OK, and I'll color in its special domains in the same way. So in turquoise here, we have another docking and dimerization domain, uh, which is bound to this first. Sorry, I said docking and dimerization domain. It should be dimerization and docking domain, OK, which is bound to this first dimerization and docking domain. OK, after that, we then have another protein kinase A inhibitor site here, which will bind to a catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. And then we have the two in tandem cyclic AMP binding sites in blue here, one there and then the next here. OK, right. So this now makes a regulatory subunit dimer. OK, now the next thing we need to discuss is the fact that there is more than one regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. OK, so there are actually four regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. And these regulatory subunits of protein kinase A are grouped into two main families. So there are the type 1 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A uh, denoted by R1s. OK, so R for regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, 1 for type 1. And then there are also type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, R2s. OK, so in each of these families, you have two different regulatory subunit proteins. So in the type 1 regulatory subunit of protein kinase A family, you have the type 1 regulatory subunit alpha and also the type 1 regulatory subunit beta. OK, meanwhile, in the type 2 family of regulatory subunits, you have the type 2 regulatory subunit alpha and again also the type 2 regulatory subunit beta. So there are these four separate proteins for which are all regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. They will all have different sequences of amino acids, but they will all have these same four basic domains in the same order. And they can all dimerize together like this to make a regulatory subunit dimer. OK, right. So the question then becomes, how do they dimerize together? Because you need to take two of these, and then the question arises, well, do you necessarily have to have the same two regulatory subunits in each of these slots, or can you put one here and then a different type of regulatory subunit here? OK, right. So the first thing to say is that if you pick to use type 1 regulatory subunits, you can either form homodimers, OK, of the two types of type 1 regulatory subunits. OK, and what I mean by that is homo means the same, dimer means uh, two-membered structure. OK, so this is a structure which contains two identical regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. OK, um, you can either make type 1 regulatory subunit alpha homodimers, where you have a type 1 regulatory subunit alpha here and also a type 1 regulatory subunit alpha here, OK, or a type 1 regulatory subunit beta here and also a type 1 regulatory subunit beta here. So they can both form homodimers, OK, but you can also get a heterodimer, OK, and um, this will involve having one type 1 regulatory subunit alpha in one of these as one of these and then a type 1 regulatory subunit beta as the other. OK, right. Now, if the whole protein kinase A holoenzyme is formed from a backbone uh, of a regulatory subunit dimer, which is uh, made up of type 1 regulatory subunits, then the entire protein kinase A holoenzyme is known as a type 1 protein kinase A holoenzyme. OK, right. Uh, so I'll repeat that because it's worth repeating. If the regulatory subunit dimer, which you're going to use to make the type 1, sorry, you're going to use to make the protein kinase A holoenzyme is made up of type 1 regulatory subunits. So it's either uh, a homodimer of type 1 regulatory subunit alpha or type 1 regulatory subunit beta or a heterodimer of the two, then the whole protein kinase A holoenzyme, which will be formed from that, which we haven't finished yet because we still have two catalytic subunits to put in. And that will be called a type 1 protein kinase A holoenzyme. If, on the other hand, you're going to form your regulatory subunit dimer from type 2 regulatory subunits, 
then that's going to be called a type 2 protein kinase A holoenzyme. Okay, now we need to talk about how you can um, build regulatory subunit dimers out of these type 2 regulatory uh, subunits. Okay, so you can only form homodimers out of type 2 regulatory subunits. You can form a homodimer of type 2 regulatory subunit alpha, and you can also form a homodimer of type 2 regulatory subunit beta, but you can't form a heterodimer uh, of the two, and you certainly can't form heterodimers when you mix type 1 regulatory subunits with type 2 regulatory subunits. So, overall then, all of these regulatory subunits form homodimers, but Type 1 uh, regulatory subunit alpha can form a heterodimer with type 1 regulatory subunit beta. So overall, there are five different regulatory subunit backbones for your hollow enzyme that you can use. Okay, um, And if you use one of the ones which contains only type 1 regulatory subunits, then you get a type 1 protein kinase A hollow enzyme. And if you use one that is either a type 2 regulatory subunit alpha homodimer or a type 2 regulatory subunit beta homodimer, uh, then you end up with a type 2 protein kinase A homoenzyme. Okay, right. So, those are the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. So, we now need to complete the uh, protein kinase A holoenzyme. And I should just say, we will come back to the significance of a protein kinase A holoenzyme being type 1 or type 2. Okay, uh, so, to complete the protein kinase A holoenzyme, what you do is you bind two catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, which are again separate polypeptides, you bind these to the protein kinase A inhibitor sites. So these are catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, okay, or PKA for short. So I'll colour these in, in green. Okay, right. Uh, so there is more than one type of catalytic subunit as well. Okay, there are actually three different catalytic subunits. There is the catalytic subunit alpha, the catalytic subunit beta, and the catalytic subunit gamma. You can use whichever one you'd like in each of these slots, basically. Okay, and that makes you the full protein kinase A holoenzyme. Now, it is these catalytic subunits that are actually going to perform the phosphorylation of serine and threonine residues. Okay, um, however, when they are bound to the protein kinase A inhibitor sites of the regulatory subunits within a regulatory subunit dimer like so, they are not active, so they are not catalyzing the addition of phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues at the moment. So this is the inactive state, basically, and this is the state that you will have in the cytoplasmid cells, these protein kinase A holoenzymes like so. Okay, right. So before we discuss the activation of protein kinase A holoenzymes, I want to firstly discuss the significance of a protein kinase A holoenzyme being either type 1 or type 2. And remember, what this refers to is whether the regulatory subunits that you have used are either type 1 regulatory subunits or type 2 regulatory subunits. Okay, right. So... The significance, then, is that type 1 protein kinase A holoenzymes, which are built out of type 1 regulatory subunits, are generally free within the cytoplasm, okay? Whereas uh, type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes, are, which have been built out of type 2 regulatory subunits, these are generally bound to other proteins which will be bound to the cell membrane, or not only to the cell membrane, but to other membranes within the cell, so the membranes of the intracellular organelles. So let me show this with a picture. If we have here the cell membrane, okay, there are a huge class of proteins okay, known as ACAPs which combines to protein kinase A holoenzymes. And they have a much higher affinity, generally, for type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes than type 1 protein kinase A holoenzymes. So ACAP stands for A kinase, referring to protein kinase A, and then anchoring proteins. Okay? So, well, this is a single one, so I should put the singular there. A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so I'll colour this A kinase anchoring protein, or this ACAP, 
in an orange here. Okay, so if you are a type 2 protein kinase A and hollow enzyme, what can generally happen is you will end up bound to an ACAP, an A kinase anchoring protein. And I should stress that there is not just one type of A kinase anchoring protein, there is many different types of A kinase anchoring proteins. Okay, so basically, if you're a type 2 protein kinase A hollow enzyme, then your docking and your dimerization and docking domains here, once they've formed a dimer like so, this dimer of dimerization and docking domains of the two regulatory subunits can then be bound to by an A kinase anchoring protein. So let me show you this. So what will now happen is this dimer of these dimerization and docking domains will end up bound to the A cap like so. Okay, so I can't really show this brilliantly, but this portion here, the two dimerization and docking domains here in turquoise, these should be bound to the A cap. Okay, um, and then of course the rest of the protein kinase A holoenzyme will follow. Okay, so we've got the protein kinase A inhibitor sites here, which I'll colour in in purple, like so. And then we've got the cyclic AMP binding domains further on. Okay, so here is a cyclic AMP binding domain, followed by another cyclic AMP binding domain. And then the carboxylic acid terminal of our protein kinase A hollow enzyme. Okay, so I'll colour in these two cyclic AMP binding domains in blue here. Okay, right, and then the same on the other side, of course, as well. So this um, regulatory subunit will also have its two cyclic AMP binding domains. And at the moment, there's no cyclic AMP bound to these. So the whole hollow enzyme is still in the inactive state. Okay, and of course, we haven't quite finished the hollow enzyme yet. At the moment, we've just got the regulatory subunit dimer here. Okay, so we need now to put in the two catalytic subunits, one here and one here. Okay, and I'll colour those in, in light green again. Okay, right. So, if you are a type 2 protein kinase A hollow enzyme, meaning that your regulatory subunits are type 2 regulatory subunits, the docking and dimerization domain is likely to end up bound to an A kinase anchoring protein, and therefore you are end up, the whole hollow enzyme ends up bound to the um, underside of membranes, basically. So, for instance, the underside of the cell membrane, or also they can end up bound to membranes of the intracellular organelles, such as the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the nucleus, things like that. Okay, right. So now let's discuss the activation, then, of the protein kinase A enzymes. So this is the same for type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A hollow enzymes. What will happen is four cyclic AMP molecules need to come along. And I will show cyclic AMP molecules as little ovals uh, coloured in the yellow. Okay. And what's going to happen is four cyclic AMP molecules are going to bind to uh, these four cyclic AMP binding domains that we have within our protein kinase A hollow enzyme. Okay, when cyclic AMP binds to these four domains, it triggers conformational changes in the regulatory subunits, which then leads to the regulatory subunits releasing the catalytic subunits. Okay, and I'll show this now. So, um, well, let me show this. So, here's the amino group. And I should stress also, if we're talking about a type 2 protein kinase A hollow enzyme here, okay, then we've talked about the fact that the type 2 regulatory subunits tend to end up bound to A kinase anchoring proteins via their dimerization and docking domains here. Okay, um, if that is the case, and the whole hollow enzyme is bound to the A kinase anchoring protein, then once it activates, the regulatory subunit dimer will remain bound to the A kinase anchoring proteins, even though the catalytic subunits have been released. Okay, so that's just an important point. So, here's the amino terminus again of our regulatory subunit. Here are our two dimerization and docking domains. Okay, so I'll colour these in in turquoise as ever. Okay. And then we're going to have next up our protein kinase A inhibitor sites, which are now no longer going to have the catalytic subunits bound to them. Okay, so the catalytic subunits will be released. Okay, so here are 
uh, the um, protein kinase A inhibitor sites in purple here. And now I will need to show a conformational change having occurred. So the easiest way I can do this is show it, instead of in this L shape, I'll show it having gone to a straight shape like so. So this is just demonstrating the conformational change that has occurred. Okay, so we now have these cyclic AMP molecules bound within these cyclic AMP binding domains. Okay, so here in blue, these are the cyclic AMP binding domains, one and then two in tandem, and they both have cyclic AMP molecules bound to them, one and two. Okay, and on the other side, you're also going to have a similar uh, status. So here is the first cyclic AMP binding domain, and here is our second cyclic AMP binding domain, and then we'll have the carboxylic acid terminus over here, and in these cyclic AMP binding sites on the cyclic AMP binding domains, we have these two molecules of cyclic AMP. Okay, in blue, here are the cyclic AMP binding domains. And then in yellow, here is the two molecules of cyclic AMP. And now we've released the catalytic subunits. So what then are the catalytic subunits going to go and do? Well, they're now going to go and phosphorylate uh, the uh, Kreb proteins. So remember, going back to this story here, remember we had the Kreb dimers attached to promoter regions of our period and cryptochrome genes. Okay, and then past the basic region which binds the DNA here, which is after the leucine zipper up here, you then have this portion that contains the KID domain, remember the kinase inducible domain, which contains serine 133, which was the target phosphorylation site of our calcium carmogen independent kinase. Protein kinase A catalytic subunits will also phosphorylate that serine 133. So what will happen now is the catalytic subunits will go into the nucleus, they'll phosphorylate serine 133 on these Kreb proteins, Kreb binding protein will then bind, and now this acts as a transcriptional enhancer, so it will increase the affinity of RNA polymerase 2 for binding to this promoter region, and therefore you'll get an increase in the production of mRNA, and therefore an increase in the production of the period protein and the cryptochrome protein, and that will help to reset the uh, circadian oscillator within these suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons. Okay, right, so... To conclude and to make one final remark then, we have seen that every cell in the human body has its own circadian clock. It has this oscillation in period and cryptochrome protein level which uh, repeats every 24 hours. Okay, so it has a 24 hour heartbeat effectively. Okay, right. What we've then seen is that if you just have a plate of cells uh, in a petri dish, um, these cells will not all be in synchrony, okay? They will all think it's a different time, effectively. However, in the human body, all of the cells do think that it's, it, that, that it's the same time, that all of their circadian oscillators are in tune. And this is kept in control by the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the brain. And in turn, the suprachiasmatic nuclei are in tune to the light-dark cycle right, via this pathway from the retina, which has these photoreceptive retinal ganglion cells, to the suprachiasmatic nuclei via the retinohypothalamic tract.